is Cook and Connect, featuring world-renowned chef Michael Twitty. As we begin, I want to mention some of the thinking that got us to this evening, leading up to asking Michael to share his important experience as an openly gay African-American Jewish writer and chef and his exploration of identity. We envision bringing our community together in a pandemic appropriate setting to engage in a thought provoking and yet highly approachable way. Creating this connection with each other and addressing these important issues um, is what Cook and Connect series is all about. During this program, Michael will first briefly teach us how to make black eyed peed hummus. And then in the main interview moderated by fellow congregant Ivy Barsky, Michael will explore how he uses food and the table to navigate these complicated issues and contemporary challenges of racial inequality and intersectional identity. We encourage everyone to submit their questions and comments during the program in the chat box and they will be incorporated into the interview. We may not get to everyone's questions, but we're gonna do our best. We're so happy to see everyone virtually and spend time with you all. We are especially grateful to each of you, our generous supporters for making a meaningful contribution to RS and for your philanthropic participation. Without the commitment of the following people and organizations, we could not be here tonight. Thank you to the Joseph W. Rosenbluth Fund, to our corporate sponsors, including First Trust Bank, Intech Contractors and Construction Managers, Divine Brothers Mechanical Contractors, CCS Fundraising, Goldstein's Rosenberg's Raphael Sachs Funeral Home, and to our Cook and Connect series patrons, along with our event patrons, and to everyone who has participated philanthropically. You have made this evening possible and we're very grateful. We want to give sincere thanks to our philanthropy committee members for their dedication. Ivy Barsky, who is also our moderator this evening, our president, Hank Bernstein, Bonnie Breyer, Jonathan Broder, Rachel Collins-Clark, Eric Dickstein, Chip Ellis and Henry Patterson, Michael Houtman, Jill Ivy, Jonathan Klein, Deborah Clare, Monica Kramer, Jonathan Krauss, Ellen Poster, Mickey and Ellen Simon, and Fred Stroper. We also would like to sincerely thank Rabbi Maderer, along with Rabbi Friedman and Cantor Glassman, our rabbis Emeriti, Fuchs, and Kuhn, our executive director, Jeff Katz, Dina Horowitz, Alyssa Geller, Marcia Biggs, and more who have been working behind the scenes. You all should have received your virtual program via email. If you want to locate it during this program, a link is in the chat box for you. If anyone wants to follow Michael's Black Eyed Pea cooking demo in real time, we encourage you to find the recipe and the instructions in the PDF as well. Also, we have put a link to Michael's book, The Cooking Gene in the chat box if anyone feels moved to purchase it after the program. A few small housekeeping notes before we begin. Please remember to stay muted throughout the program and submit any questions in the chat box. This cooking demo and conversation will last until about 8 p.m. I would now like to introduce Rabbi Jill Matterer as she welcomes us all with a Devar Torah. Hi, everybody. Good evening. It is good to see you all. We, um, we are here in the part of the Torah that is just beginning the book of Exodus. We just read about the launch to our incredible and inspiring story of redemption. And it began with the scene of the burning bush, the flames of the burning bush and God calling to Moses. And in those moments, Moses understands more clearly his purpose on this earth. It's a call to all of us to understand our purpose. How can each of us in our own way do God's work here on earth? How can each of us identify our own mitzvah? How grateful we are to welcome Michael Twitty who has so clearly understood an incredible mitzvah, an incredible purpose that he personally can bring by bringing together Jewish values, social justice, Jewish community, food, and all together, and Jewish culture, or cultures, I should say, and all together bringing purpose to that work. It has been quite a season for us all, and I'm grateful to Serena Shapiro for finding a way to gather us 
and to find a way to have a meaningful philanthropic gathering in such a limited time when we can't be together physically. And once again, we have somebody before us who has found a really special purpose. Our congregation too has found its purpose in this virtual world. And each of you by being here and bringing your support and your presence, each of you are bringing a part of your purpose and helping the congregation fulfill our whole purpose. And so thank you, many thanks to each of us. And may we find inspiration in the flames of the burning bush as we continue to discover each of our work here on earth. Thank you so much, Rabbi, for those words of Torah. I would now like to introduce our moderator and beloved congregant, Ivy Barsky. Ivy is a seasoned nonprofit professional with a passion for arts and culture and an appetite for making a dent in the universe. She was previously the CEO and director of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia and currently has her own independent consultancy helping nonprofit organizations realize their mission and visions. Welcome. Thank you, Serena, Rabbi, and everyone who's made this great program possible. Um, I want to introduce our speaker and guest this evening who we are so grateful to have. Michael Twitty is an openly gay African-American Jewish writer, culinary historian, and educator. He's the author of The Cooking Gene, published by HarperCollins Amistad, which won the 2018 James Beard Foundation Book Award uh, for Book of the Year, as well as the category for writing. The book was also a finalist for the Kirkus Prize in Nonfiction, the Art of Eating Prize, and a Barnes & Noble New Discoveries finalist in nonfiction. Um, we, you will see for yourselves that we are honored to have in our midst a great storyteller and uh, a fabulous guest to RS this evening. Uh, Michael Twitty is going to start with a cooking demonstration of a black-eyed pea hummus, and then we'll have a conversation and incorporate some of your questions. So. Thank you, Michael, and take it away. Okay, so everybody, you can clearly see that I am, I am not one of these lifestyle food people where the Martha got the Martha Stewart kitchen and all that nonsense. Um, I'm cooking, cooking from my office. Not cooking. I'm not cooking at all. I'm preparing black eyed pea hummus from my office, and I want to thank, um, um, thank the rabbi for saying something so wonderful. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that in just like, thank you for saying something nice. I mean, thank you for um, almost making me cry before I got started because it is, it's nice, beyond nice. Nice isn't even the word. It's fulfilling to have someone say, clearly you have a, you know, you have um, a destiny and you have a purpose and you have a, have a, a path. And, you know, as we all know, that's one of the things that horrifies us in our life path is like, have I actually found my purpose? And it's funny because when I asked my mother, my mom and daddy, my mama busted memory and my father who's still here, thank God, asked me when I was a little boy, I must've been six or seven. They asked, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna be when you grow up? Which is like a weird question, even though it's the question everybody asks. And I told my mom and daddy, I said, I wanna be a preacher, I want to be a teacher, I want to be a chef, <laughs> and I want to be a writer. You know, that was it. And one day, I think towards the end of my like Hebrew school teaching days, for which I've earned every gray hair on my head. By the way, everybody here who has ever taught Hebrew school, I taught Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, Reconstructionist, Renewal, and they were all in Michigan. And every gray hair on my every white hair on my head at the age of 43 is because of my Hebrew school students. So if anybody in this mass collective is a part of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, please submit my name for 15 years 
of teaching seventh grade Hebrew school and sixth grade Hebrew school and the older teenagers because I earned every stripe. So that's that. So just a shameless plug apart from please buy my book. Um, <laughs> it keeps the work going. Um, yeah, this is all a part of it. And it's uh, I do this recipe often because it doesn't require fire, although now I have one of those little um, induction burners. It doesn't require uh, animal flesh. It's, it's totally vegan, vegetarian, halal, kosher, um, all the boxes, I uh, guess. Um, and the ingredients that I use, I try to, I try to go as uh, ethical as, as I can with what I have. Now, you may be wondering why black eyed pea hummus? And I'm going to kind of straighten out my screen a little bit and a little bit. I'm not, like I said, I don't do this often. So you can see everything that I have in front of me. We're going to get, we're going to get to that. But black eyed pea hummus is uh, something, um, it's also in the book, shameless plug number two. Um, it's also a recipe that I do because it's reflective of a lot of different identities. I call my home cooking Afro Ashkafardi. I go there. And it's reflective of the fact that my family's cuisine is not strictly African American and Southern, but was mostly. And then, um, you know, all the stuff I've put out, you'll know that my, my family's tradition was not locked into a, a box. We were, I mean, we had all the influences. The fact that my family, before I was born, lived in um, England and East Africa. Uh, the fact that, you know, that's where my mom grew up was London, um, a blessed memory. And my uncles and, and aunts down to the last one who was born in Kenya, Nairobi. Um, and of course, before that, as you can find out in the book and other places, um, our story is a global story. It's a diaspora story. And it's still a diaspora story. Um, there's so many people who are part of my family bloodline and our narrative that are scattered throughout the globe. I mean, the tendency is to view African-Americans as cut off people. Um, kind of in the same way that Yehudim, Jews were viewed as a cut off people. But the reality is we are a diaspora family and our identity is not our phenotype or even so much, even our faith to the letter, but it's the meaning and purpose as, 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 as Rabbi alluded to that makes us a family, that makes us so. And um, it's it's bizarre. It's, it's This journey has been interesting in the past, I don't know, since 2011, 2012, when I started what I called the Southern Discomfort Tour, which became the cooking gene. Um, yeah, I went there. It's, just, it's not that much comfort down there, not here, or here rather. I'm just beyond the, the Mason-Dixon line in Maryland, your neighbor state. But um, it's, it's knowing that we need to understand something. And, I'm, and, I, and I promised our folks that I would not be political. I'm not being political. I'm just being ethical. Um, it's really important that we understand that we are all connected. We're not going to stop being connected. This blood in my veins connects me to, to mi billions, not millions, billions of people across the planet. Not every single soul in person and body, but a lot of people. And I wonder at what point do we want to stop having civil wars and world wars in our brains, in our kishkas, in our hearts? You know, this, this, is, this is my Devar Torah. The bottom line is, is that we, we, we're, we're too used to conflict and we're not used enough to shalom. You know, shalom bias. The world is our home. The world is our bias. The whole entire world needs to needs to consider that we are mishpaka, and we come from many mishpakas. The Jewish people's a mishpaka. That is the one idea that separates, I think, those who know and understand us as a people from those who don't. There are the rest of the world that look at us and they go, "Oh, they're just a faith, they're just a church, a, a church among many churches." No, we're not. No, we're not. We're not defined by the word synagogue. We're defined by the word. Mishpacha. We're defined by the word mishpacha. We're defined by the word familia. We are a family, and that's what's meant, what makes us a people. One of the most, one of the experiences I'm writing into my new book, Kosher Soul, is 
I was riding a bus to go to a synagogue, modern Orthodox Sephardic synagogue. And this guy sees me. I know, and I, I, and we both pick up on the fact that we're, we're part of the Jewish family. And he talks to me, and I'm talking to him, and he goes, "He's, he, he's not rude about it. He doesn't come right out and ask me how, how come, why are you? So you're different. Why are you here?" He, he kind of, he kind of peels the onion a bit, and he just teases. Then he finally goes into, "So what made you da da da?" And I give this very, you know, right out of the mikveh. Very positive, sort of like, and he says, I got to tell you something. And I got to tell you what the guy looked like. He was very, very green, very granola, very earthy. Um, he still had the red clay of Montgomery County on his sandals, and he had a bad thing of vegetables. You know, my kind of, my, my other kind of people. And he says, you will know your place in the Jewish family when you can't stand any of us, but you still got to show up. And I said, yeah. And then many years later, I'm like, mm -hmm. he was right. And I didn't take offense. I was like, I think he just gave me a Tuesday with two days, Tuesdays with Maury moment on that one. And it's very true. Um, when we're part of families, sometimes it's very hard to be family with each other, but we got to be family. And we got to be there for each other. And in that spirit, I really thank you for not welcoming me because I'm any different than anybody else, which I am. I take pride in that. But thank you for having me here in a family moment when we need family a lot. This is a family moment. This is this whole Michigas and service we're going through, have been going through, and the pandemic are a family moment. We need each other. And I'm so pleased that you're at one of my tables to celebrate the fact that we still got we we still need each other as Americans, as Jews as um, people of diaspora backgrounds, as survivors, as nurturers, as creators. So I salute everybody. Black Eyed Peas. Black Eyed Peas are as Black diaspora, African diaspora, and Jewish diaspora as you get. They are from what other people call Sub-Saharan Africa. I just call it Africa, because that's a kind of a colonial term, um, from where Nigeria, Niger, and Chad meet. They are a 10,000 year old domesticated food. Um, they go back earlier than that when people were gathering um, their pulses and vegetables. They make it into um, Jewish literature, rabbinic literature in the time of the Babli, the Babylonian Talmud. And they're listed, they're, they're, they're different references, but the one that I'm talking about in particular is iconic because it's the reference made to Rosh Hashanah. So that one of the Rosh Hashanah um, foods that's supposed to encourage um, not just, not luck, they're not luck foods. They're actually, a, or they're kind of an ethical directive food. So, and some of them are foods of, of protection. They're based on puns. So uh, Lubia or Rubia, depending upon where in the Middle East you come from, are black eyed peas. Black eyed peas really came from Sub-Saharan Africa, if you want to call it that. And then during the Roman period, when people and foods and things came up out of the Nile Valley into what we call the, should call Southwest Asia, and into Southern Europe, basically the Mediterranean basin, um, black eyed peas were basically like the green bean. Before, there were no green beans, no, there were no kidney beans, there were no, um, none, of, none of that. Fasciolus vulgaris was not found in the um, old world. It was found only in the Americas. But um, black eyed peas, if you know, when they grow, they grow these long green pods. And until they start forming, they can basically cook them like green beans. Um, so they were a food that was, that was said by the Hazab, by the rabbis, to encourage people to do acts of mitzvah, mitzvot. So that's the reason why you eat them. Those of you who know about Southern culture know that black eyed peas are eaten on secular New Year for good luck. Very little, very different, but 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 similar. Um, in West Africa, which I've been to seven, seven, to, uh, seven times to eight countries, every country you find black eyed peas. They're a daily staple. They make it into something that looks like falafel called akara. Akara is a, a black eyed 
P. Fritter. Um, in Senegal, they're called Niebe. And um, Chebu Niebe is black eyed peas, sorry, rice with black eyed peas. If you know the Caribbean, if you know Latin America, if you know the South, you know, there are a lot of dishes that involve beans and rice or black eyed peas and rice. And the one that we eat for New Year's is called Hop and John. I made that with my husband, um, Bezrat Hashem, the year will be blessed. And we have black eyed peas for change, which is not what's also a pun. That's a frequent thing in, New in international New Year food traditions. Is they're based on like linguistic puns. So for example, in China for Lunar New Year, you eat shrimp because Lung Ha sounds like people laughing. So you eat that to make, to bring in the New Year with laughter. Same thing in Judaism, that the pun in Aramaic is about making mitzvot happen, multiplying your mitzvot, the way the black eyed peas grow, they, they're, they're a quick growing crop in dry weather. And by the same token, we eat black eyed peas and Southern food for change, money, and for the year changing around, the fortunes changing, life changing. Um, in West Africa, black eyed peas are a food that um, is symbolic of the eye of God because it's, it's a, it has an eye on it that never closes, just like the omnipotence of God. It's a food, and in Senegal, you'll find this interesting, which is a Muslim country, mostly. Um, it's eaten and shared with people who don't have money as an act of sadaqa. Sound familiar? Um, and actually, you're supposed to make the black eyed peas and not just drop them off. You're supposed to sit there with the person. If you want a blessing for good fortune, for money, for, for changing your life circumstance, you're supposed to make the pot of uh, chebunyebe, black eyed peas and rice, and bring it to a mendicant, bring it to a family that doesn't have a lot to eat and share it with them, share it a meal with them. You know, eat the smallest amount you can because it's, you're not supposed to shame them. And then when the pot is empty, then you can go to the imam, then you can go to the traditional holy man because it's the, that's how spirituality works in Africa. It's not, it's, it's multiple level. And you can ask for a blessing only when you bless somebody else. So I like that. But I also tell you those these stories and the stories about black eyed peas being associated with um, Oshun in Yoruba tradition in Southwest Nigeria. Um, the Orisha or the spirit, the saint, the angel, the god of, of female press spirit of wealth and feminine sexuality, prosperity and, and fertility. Because the Akara, the black eyed pea fritters look like falafel they're shared between husband and wife and moi moi to encourage uh, fertility, the generations, the flow of the generations to honor Oshun because she's the romantic love. And I say all this to you because I want those of you who aren't familiar to understand that um, part of the work that I've been doing with food and other things is a small part of a larger project um, that I think that the, my other folks have been doing for quite some time. And that is kind of the recovery work after the transatlantic slave trade. I, I, people need to understand we lost a lot of important things. We were not a primitive people in little mud huts and villages. And you know, some people, some unfortunate people use some certain words about where my ancestors came from. Um, it's an intricate, beautiful heritage with a lot of ethical and moral and spiritual principles. And there, you know, I, I shouldn't have to say this, but you know, we, you know. With a, with a very old Jewish story. A lot of places in West Africa I went to, I was actually, um, I shouldn't have been astonished, but I, but I saw that there were these lingering parts of a Jewish diaspora that had died out. Um, and that in a kosher soul, I'm actually kind of recovering that history. What happens to these Jews of African descent once they end up in slave ships? What happens to these stories? Do they, do they continue? Do they move on? So this food for me symbolizes the kind of a unity of two parts of myself. I often tell people that when I deal with people who are not that not that nice, not that smart, not that bright, not that cool, I can do one of two things. Um, I can um, shut the door and say, forget you, or I can put food in their mouth so they, so they stop talking. And as they're eating, I tell them, tell them about themselves. So, Black Eyed Pea Hummus. I made the unfortunate mistake. Let me make sure I got you. See, instead of my messy books, you can see 
this. I have over 3,500 books. These are not all of them. So I have I have a really bad habit. I want to change that habit in 2021 because I am I'm and me and Amazon been on been on like lovers' terms since this damn pandemic. I mean every week something showing up and secondhand books showing up. So there we go. I'm gonna see everybody's faces later, but right now I want to make sure that you see what I see, what I see, you see. You understand what I'm saying? All right. So um Serena, I want you to thumbs up if you can see what I'm doing. All right, great. There you go. So first, I'm going to do this really quickly because I didn't want to forget. I had to get up during the during the introduction because I had to get a little bit of sugar. And it's really funny because people think recipes are the exact things. Those of you who actually cook know that's a total lie. It's based on like, um, the, you know, what is in Yiddish? A shit rhyme method. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. So every time I give this recipe out to like kitchens to make this, they make it sugary. And I hate that. Because the, the idea behind this little cube of sugar is that the, there's like tons of lemon in this. Because black eyed peas, I got to tell you something. In, uh, in, in, in Sahel Africa, Sahelian Africa, which is the dry belt between the Sahara and the Savannah, they use stale black eyed peas as cement. I'm not joking. You know those beautiful like mud mosques, mosques in West Africa? They're made out of mud. There's a rainy season, there's a dry season. You know how they've been, they, how they've stood like the test of centuries made out of mud and sticks? They take black eyed peas and mud and mix them together as a slurry. And when it's during the dry season, the stale ones, it forms a cement, so help me, on top of these moss. And that's how they last through the, the, the rainy season, which is very short, but it's devastating. So there's almost no, there's almost no water coming in because these black eyed peas. So they're very strong. They suck up a lot of um, the lemon juice we put into them. So you use an enormous amount of lemon juice just to be able to taste it, but also provide moisture. But you got to have a little bit of sugar in there, but not a lot. But these, these, uh, these kitchens, they're crazy. They sit up there and they put in like a pound of sugar. And I'm like, I'm eating candy. I'm not eating black eyed pea hummus anymore. I mean, what's going on with that? So it's just a little um, cube of turbinado sugar, raw sugar. And I'm gonna scrape it out so we can put it back in later. It's not a lot. You don't, it, it just tempers the, the acid. It does nothing else. Which is why these people, they make the recipe in bulk and they think you gotta multiply the sugar. No, you don't. If you, if you knew how to cook, you wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. So. Everybody relax. I use my hand sanitizer before I started. My hands are clean. My mother, my mother, blessed memory, is standing over my shoulder right now going, are your hands clean? Don't let the people see your hands not clean. I raised you better than that. I can hear. This is one of the things that actually makes me feel very um, fulfilled is the fact that, you know, in the, in the narratives of life and death, which are, you know, frequent these days, my mom has been, has really showed herself every time I cook. And one time I was in the kitchen, my little small kitchen, and I said something to the effect out loud of, I'm grown, I don't have to wash dishes while I cook. And so help me, every like three things off the top of my refrigerator, which had not moved in a year, fell off the refrigerator at that exact moment. And I said, oh, okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm washing the dishes whatever you need. And I could just see the smile on my mother's face going, uh-huh, you, you think you grown, you're not grown, you're still my baby. You're gonna do what I say. So that is, it's a comfort to me to cook and cook for other people. So I made this recipe in Jerusalem one time, big mistake. And I made this in front of a group of Israelis, Israel, Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs and, and Palestinians. And I almost, I almost caused a riot in which I was the only victim. Now. This is how this goes. I'm in Jerusalem. I'm in um, the um, Avram ho Hostel, not far from Machne Yehuda. And there are, there gathered there are these 50 plus Israeli Jews, a couple of American Jews, Israeli Arabs and Palestinians looking at me going, okay, you're gonna teach us about, this black guy from America gonna teach us what about hummus? And there were two chefs and they were like, the most testosterone-driven 
well, all male chefs are testosterone driven. Let's just get that out of the way. Chefs you'd ever seen in your entire life. One was Palestinian and one was Israeli. And apparently they were they were best friends and be, and, 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 and best enemies. And they sat across the table from each other like they were like at any moment they were gonna do um, arm wrestling. And so I'm there to present this, this recipe as part of the, you know, Jerusalem Jewish Film Festival. And the question became, and they went back and forth, like they were like tag teaming on a script. So the Israeli guy goes, hey, Michael, welcome. Let me ask you. So the Palestinian guy goes, who invented, back to Israeli, the hummus? Was it the Israeli or the Palestinian? Which one, Michael? We need an answer now. You must tell us right now who invented hummus. So I'm like, so I go Israeli. I'm like, eh, eh. So at that exact moment, ladies and gentlemen, the, ho the hospital that was not far from that room, there was a, a Jewish woman, Hasidic, a Muslim imam, and there was a Christian, all waiting to go to heaven. They stopped dying so to hear my answer. The, I mean, the burk, the, 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 the burak was waiting to carry this poor imam to Allah. The, the Jewish woman was, the, 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 the sapphires on Hashem's throne were gleaming at her. And Jesus in the white light was ready for the Christian. The birds stopped flying. The people stopped walking on the street. Everybody's waiting for my answer and I'm sweating bullets. And everybody's looking at me with this intent sort of like, how's he gonna answer? Okay. And I'm, I'm doing my best chocolate tevye, right? I'm sitting up there going, um, who invented hummus? Was it the Jews or the Arabs or, or who? Oh, no, it wasn't who invented, who owns it, who owns it? And so I looked at them and I, I did a tell you, you know, he's right, she's right, they're both right. So I look at the, I look at the Israeli and I go, of course, <laughs> homeless belongs to us Jews. And they all start, I mean, I'm not joking, they all start clapping and acting like, like almost like, yeah, we knew he was one, really one of us. But I said, wait a minute. It belongs to the Arabs, it belongs to the Palestinians. And they start, ah! okay. But I said, actually guys, it belongs to, to all of us. And they go, huh? I said, look, I'm just trying to kiss you behind because I don't want you to beat me out of Jerusalem altogether. I mean, that's, I don't want to cause unity that way. I want peace, but I don't want peace being a, being meaning I got to eat a piece of my tukas. So here's the deal. Hummus belongs to some poor woman whose kids were hungry, who was not Jewish, who was not Muslim, who lived somewhere in the Fertile Crescent, who, whose kids were hungry. She had chickpeas, she had some garlic, and she had some oil, and she had some bread. She was like, eat this and go to bed. So, nah, if it, that, thank that poor woman who had to get her kids fed and sit in the bed thousands of years ago. Don't get all, don't get all macho about this. And everybody cheered, the, 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 the three people went to heaven, the birds started flying again. And that is how Michael Twitty, Akiba bin Avraham Vasara, brought peace to Jerusalem. You can thank me later. Also, remember the Nobel Peace Prize, I need it. So, back to the Black Eyed Bee Hummus. When you're Jewish and Black and gay, every food comes with a story, so sorry, there will be tangents. Now, what do you need? I'm not gonna do this recipe block by block, because you don't cook that way and I don't cook that way, those of you who actually cook. Those of you who don't cook, you better get that book and start praying and start cooking. Do what you got to do. You got another like at least nine months of pandemic healing and vaccinating. So you got time to learn how to cook. Um, so here's the deal. Black eyed peas. I've already crushed them up. Uh, those of you who are really, really granola organic and, and whole foodsy and everything, I love you. But please don't boil your own black eyed peas for this and make your own black unless you really feel the need to. Because the perfect consistency is in a can of black eyed peas. That's just like chickpeas. You you know, if you if you make your own chickpea hummus, as we say in the South, bless your heart. But as for me and my people, we shall open the can. Now, make sure that it's lower sodium and make sure that it's kosher. 
this has the OU on it, so we're all good. All good in the hood, Rabbi. Um, so you pop it open and you drain it. You can use you can have a little bit of juice in it, but not too much. You don't want the canned stuff. You want the moisture is just there to help it move along. Normally, I would do this in a um, food processor, but I have a dog that's a Philadelphian that's from the street who doesn't like noises like that, and I don't want him barking and howling during a presentation. So I'm using a stone mortar and pestle. Thank you very much. He's actually at my feet right now asleep. Um, I told I told Serena that my 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 new best friend, uh, my fourth dog, was found by the Schuylkill River, and he was rescued. So. Um, he lived outside blind for several years. So he's very happy to be in a warm home, but I don't want to wake him up with the food processor. So you can do this more than one way. And um, I think they should probably do this in the big bowl and put it in here for, for show. So here are the black eyed peas, which are macerated. That is not a dirty word. So Google if you need to. And uh, you make you basically make a, a good mush with the black eyed peas. Serena, I see that, that that smirk on your face. And if you don't, for the, the food processor makes them really smooth once you put them through. This will be a little chunky and that's fine. Um, you can see the little eyes in there. That shows you that God is watching you. And so don't mess it up. Um, so that's the basis. We want to put a little bit of olive oil. Please don't add, if you want measurements, the recipe is on the paper. That's the best I could do. I'm not going to use measurements right now. That's not how I cook. A little bit of olive oil. This is not special. This is just, you know, whatever food. As a Talmud says, you know, you don't, don't always serve the food of kings. So tahini, sesame paste, very important. Sesame is also one of those foods that bridges Africa and Asia. And I'm just going to use my banku stick. This is from Ghana. It's called a banku stick. You, and I have like a like three of these that are really big one, and they're awesome. So this is how you cook everything in, in West Africa. And so, I, you know, you mix it up. And it's long because of the, the pots they use over there are the big um, homemade pottery, or they use cast iron. And this keeps you from getting burnt. And it's also the, the spoon you use to mix things, you know, when you're cooking outside. That's the West African way. You see, it's already like kind of hummusy with that tahini coming out at you. We're gonna do the spices last. I already mixed up, mashed some garlic. You can, all, you can never have too much garlic. Um, keeps the vampires away and the werewolves too. There's an amazing story about the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism and keeping the werewolves back. But we don't have time to tell it. Invite me back on um, on Jewish Halloween for that. All right, cool. So the garlic goes in. It's a lot of garlic. Like this is this is this is serious garlic. So if you're a garlic lover, know that I put about ten garlic cloves in here. Yeah, it's a lot, and it's going to like burn on the way down. It's going to be great. So I love the banku stick. I brought back from Africa um, um, a special bowl from Ghana that where it has grooves in it. So when you mash your turmeric and garlic and ginger, it actually starts to separate the, the chafe from the, the, the pulp of the spices. And then you use this, this little item here to mash up. Great. I have a full on mortar and pestle from Africa. And I have um, an African mortar, a small handheld mortar and pestle. So I brought back all these wonderful things from Ghana and Benin and Togo. I think my ancestors are very proud of me. Because in Africa, you cook with your body. You don't just cook with your, you know, machines. You cook with your whole system. This is the lemon juice. I'm going to incorporate at least half of it. Because remember what I said, it's a lot. It takes a lot to do that. I, that's all hand um, squeezed. It's got some lemon juice on me. Oh, that's sad. So even though I, I mashed it up and it was a little dry, it's coming together now. Now, I have some wonderful, I'm not going to do a shameless plug, but I sort of am. Um, I'm working with Spice Tribe right now um, to develop some spices. So um, you have, you'll have my information. I'm at Kosher Soul on Twitter and um, at The Cooking Gene on Instagram. And we're developing a set of 
African American heritage spices that was supposed to be during holidays, but it's going to be for Black History Month. And they're inspired by my research and also by my family. Um, but I was thinking about today, I know this chili powder in the recipe, but they have a um, ancient halabi. It's a Middle Eastern chili blend. So I just thought instead of using American chili powder, which is a very different sort of provenance and heritage, I'll use this. And their, their spices don't have salt in them, which also helps. So this has Aleppo pepper, which is from Syria, um, sumac, pap paprika, coriander, garlic, lemon peel, thyme, and cumin. So it's similar to American chili powder, but it's more, it uses the kind of chilies that you would experience um, in Israel, in Syria, in Lebanon. That used to be part of one culinary region. And it was one of the most fantastic culinary regions in um, Southwest Asia, the Middle East. Um, people don't understand this. Damascus was not only a fantastic city, but Damascus, Beirut, Jerusalem were all culinary hubs. Um, Jerusalem still is, but in a very different way because now um, our people from all over the world have come there. And so now it's extremely diverse and shows Jewish diaspora as well as the traditions that were part of that region during the Ottoman Empire days. Um, so I really wanted to use that instead. I'm using a lot of special stuff tonight um, that I normally wouldn't use. If you just have the basic stuff, that's, that's cool. I'm a spice um, um, obsessed person. So I love it when the spices are from this minute little place. So I'm using a lot of spices from uh, Spice Tribe and Burlap and Barrel, both of which are, are fantastic. So I'm gonna put a little bit of everything in at once and it's gonna be fine. Ivy and I have a lot of things, a lot of things to talk about and the maize, the consistency is great. It looks exactly like it was like baby food. Exactly, that's what it's supposed to be. Anytime somebody says puree, it's a fancy way to say I'm charging you extra for making you baby food. That's what the restaurants are doing. Sorry, I know Michael Salamanov is gonna like get me for that one when he comes on here, but you know, I'm just telling the truth. All right, what goes in first? What, what do you need? So salt and pepper first. Here's some pink Peruvian salt. I know it looks very pink on your screen. We're gonna put a little pinch in there. And we have some Vietnamese black pepper. I'm just being fancy. I'm just, you know what? This is my Generation X meets Millennial Kitchen way to be fancy. Um, a little bit of Vietnamese black pepper. You can use any black pepper you got. I got some from Zanzibar and I got some from, from Vietnam. It's all good. So put that in. You might, I want, want to put a little bit more black pepper and a little more salt, but not much because it's already got salt from being processed. That's important to know. Um, this guy right here is our Middle Eastern chili, uh, chili powder. Put in a nice good, when I say a pinch, that could mean anything from a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon, all right? My grandmother, blessed memory, who was from Alabama, was a fantastic cook. Almost broke my hand. She was not a not an uh, not. A, she was a gentle lady. The reason why she did was for she she learned. She taught me. I was supposed to say, almost said learn me. She taught me how to measure the food in the palm of my hand. So that because when she was growing up, there were no measurements. You know that's not how you, people. This is this is the deep south. People were poor, and so what they learned to do was measure in their hands. To this day, I can give you a perfect measure, almost perfect measure, not perfect of teaspoons, tablespoons, half teaspoons. Because my grandmother would take my hand and go like this and like make me do that until I got it perfect. That's how I learned how to measure. I can measure anything I want without without having to go to those little plastic uh, multicolored keys y'all got in your kitchen. I'll put a little bit more in there. I'm gonna put a nice dump of cumin. Cumin is the most important thing. And those of you who watch RuPaul, it's cumin, not cumin. Thank you very much. Um, I don't care what they say on Snatch Game. Um, a little bit of this Maris chili, it's Turkish and it's really, okay, I gotta show you. It's it's silky, it's not like, it's with possibly a little bit of olive oil. It's it's not like the chili peppers and it's not it's not extremely hot and it's not not spicy. It's kind, of in, it's kind of in the middle. And of course, paprika. Now you can do smoked paprika if you want, if you want it smoky, but remember something, smoked paprika is really strong. You don't wanna, you don't wanna overdo it. All right. Then we have our little bit of sugar that we had and the coriander. All right. So that's that. 
this will probably need something, but we're almost done with this part of the presentation. And if you want more color, go, go hard on the sweet paprika. I like more color. I like it to look pinkish when I'm done with it. I'm gonna put a little bit of everything in there that makes it a little more colorful. All right, cool. So that's your black happy hummus. Thank um, you. We're gonna, I'm gonna let it sit for a few minutes and I'm gonna let you know how it tastes when we get to the, towards the end of the presentation. Cool. Hey, Michael, thank you so much. And I know while you're kind of uh, getting your spices out of the way, I'm gonna vamp for a minute because I think that will be my only job this evening. Um, but we are really, you know, RS's kind of mission and the tagline we use on a lot of things is about making profound connections. And I think uh, Michael is incredibly gifted and shared that gift with us tonight to bring together um, connections and the intertwining of identity, culture, history, politics, cooking, and great storytelling. And we're so appreciative, Michael. So I'm gonna to try to squeeze a few questions in with you tonight, if you're ready. Yes. And thank you. And, um, and also some questions from uh, the folks who are attending so that we can get some questions in. But here's where I wanna start with this. There's a quote that you have in the book. Um, that the Yoruba say, when your mother prays for you, you are right. unstoppable. Right. So I want you to tell us a little about Patricia Anita Townsend of blessed memory, your mother, and how she helped create your identity or your interest around food. My, thank you for that. Um, my mom was, um, my mom unfortunately uh, passed away from kidney illness, which she was really getting very um, um, conscious about her health and everything for years. And then this like totally came out of nowhere. And I gotta tell you, it's, 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 it's interesting because you, you um, I thought I had a long time. I had a long time to deal, to kind of process my mom's legacy and talk to her and I didn't. So I had to, um, I had to kind of coddle that together. So the first thing I got to tell you about my mom was my mom was was um, General Patton in the kitchen. My mother did not play. When I talk about my hands being clean and everything else, my mom knew I had an interest in cooking, but she was serious. My mom used to always say, and it got on my nerves used to roll my eyes. And you know, if you know in Black Southern culture, you don't roll your eyes at your parents. But she let me get away with that one because she was a new generation. And she used to say, integrity in the kitchen, Michael, integrity in the kitchen. Oh my God. And then we would take, you know, we would make stock or soup and my mom would be like, you know, you gotta get the scum off the top. And I remember one time I did something and my, I, my mother kicked me out of that kitchen so fast. And, and I say that with a lot of love. My mom had me sit down and I remember there was, there was this book um, and it had a lot of culinary terms. And so I had to copy every culinary term and, and you know, but I kind of liked doing that for some weird reason. So I did. And, you know, I was this, you know, 11 year old kid running around knowing about vichyssoise and chiffonade and all these fancy French terms. Um, my mom was a fantastic baker and she was really the conduit because my grandmother was kind of like our old world, Alabama, the deep South. My mother was the great migration. Mom grew up in Cincinnati and my mom grew up, you know, in, in grew up around a lot of um, German Jewish folks. And so I, I, you know, every Saturday I ate challah, but not for any religious reason. I ate it because it, my mom knew how to toast it the best. And I had it with blackberry jam and apple butter and peach jam and all this other Southern stuff. And I just thought it was a Saturday treat. I didn't realize that back where she came from, you ate challah that way because the Jewish baker was the only, was the best bread on Friday morning and afternoon. 
and have the best patients on Sunday when everybody else was closed. And so that became part of our family tradition. My mother did not know that she was part Jewish, not halakhically through her father's line. Um, and it was also, it turned out to be German and Ukrainian. Um, I found out through DNA, by the way, it wasn't. And then we also heard, you know, it was oral history in the family on one part of the family. I didn't know this till much later. Um, but I remember the, one of our elders telling that story, but my mom was, my mom was uh, the best. My mom was my real culinary teacher. And I'm very proud to have had her in my life so long. She was, an, she was the smartest woman, um, smartest person I ever knew. My mother was just, um, I, I can't even, I, I can't even tell you how much I love her, mm. you know. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um... Tell us what inspires you about Jewish tradition and Jewish food. Oh my gosh! I think when I, I remember uh, many, many, many years ago, I'm at the you know how you know how when we start to get like past thirty and go towards forty, and now I'm forty three, and you go a couple years ago, and it wasn't a couple years ago. That's where I'm at with this. So um, I remember going to um, a Hadassah event with Joe Nathan. Um, the cookbook author, and, and, and she had a TV show for some years. And also Marcy Cohen Ferris, who wrote, turned her dissertation into a, a very important book called Matzah Ball Gumbo. And I remember going with them, and I remember the feeling of just like hearing these two people who I very much admired, and they, 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 and they, were, they invited me along. They wanted me to be a part of this. And just just the, the stories and the fact that food connected, food was not just the food you ate in front of your face. You know, blacks and Jews have an, um, the most endearing and annoying habit. We're the only two peoples when we eat dinner, we talk, we eat a big family dinner, we talk about the next meal we're gonna have and the meal we had before it, but never actually talk about the food in front of us. And I can tell you that from experience because I grew up with Italians, Chinese, Greeks. I mean, the, some of the oldest food traditions in the world, but only blacks and Jews go, you know what, I, I, you know, I can't wait to have this. I had that before. And then of course, we're the only two groups of people in the world who want you to eat awful food. You know, only blacks and Jews go, this is terrible, eat it. It's like, we have to, we're, we're already pressed enough. We gotta eat more oppression for God's sakes. And so, you know, the Jewish person, eat it, it's terrible. You'll, you'll hate it. Black version, you gotta eat, this is nasty. I don't even know why I cooked this. I'm like, why do I gotta eat this mother? Please tell me why. Because your great, it's always because your grandmother did it, right? The grandfather did it. Um, and I was just, you know, I've met Claudia Roden and I've had, you know, conversation with Faith, Faith Levy. And these are all people, and Gil Marks, a blessed memory. Rabbi Gil Marks was an amazing cook as well as a clergy. And I was just blown away by the, the, the intricate way that Jewish law, halakha, midrash, all sort of filtered down through food. That the food was actually a text. The food told a story. The food was uh, part of the narrative. You can't eat, it's inextricable. And that it had layers of history. That was very important. So when I first started, so Ivy, when I first started doing these recipes, I, I did them in a very, I, I guess I thought traditional because it's not a cookbook traditional. Cookbook is nothing, it's, it's sort of an archive, but it's not. It's one person's version out of hundreds of how to do a food. But I looked at different recipes, different versions, and I learned about regions that all Ashkazi cooking wasn't the same, and all Sephardic and Mizrahi cooking wasn't the same. There were variations in Morocco, there were variations in Poland, there were variations in Ethiopia, in China, and India, and other places. So that was a big that was a big thing. I had to master the way it was done. And then the next level was knowing that American Jewish food was very different, and um, also blended those regions together, no matter where you were from, and learned the Canadian Jewish food was different. So I really went on this other sort of like rabbit hole. And then the more and more I started to really have a, a personal relationship with the food was when I changed it to being Afro Ashkafardi. I was like, wait a minute, hold up. We do things this way. And I said, we can do, we can do diaspora because both communities represent global diaspora. They, you know, all the ingredients you want, all the diversity of flavors and opinions and ideas just mix it up and have fun. That's why I started having fun with the food. So that's that's kind of what it means to me, and how it's you know it's how it's impacted my journey. And you know now I can 
cook with those ladies I mentioned, and and it's 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 a blessing to be able to say that I kind of sat at their feet and learned some stuff. Then I, then I, everybody I came across, I would actually kind of like interview in a very subtle way. Mm-hmm. And then I would ask them questions. The one I want to tell you about really quickly before we move on is that one of my um, fellow congregants and fellow teachers, her um, ex-mother-in-law, um, what, Claire, she was cooked with me. And I loved it because Claire's hands looked like my grandmother's hands. And so I spent the time listening to her but also like watching her hands because I didn't have my grandmother anymore. And she was very similar because she was very, you know, hip and on it and, you know, you know, very, you know, very present. And the one little story she told, two little stories she told me was her father, um, when they lived in Crown Heights before it, was, before it became more of a Hasidic neighborhood, her father would open the window next to their living room because the synagogue was right across, well, maybe four feet across the airspace, and he would give them like 10 bucks to open up their window. So Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, he had to buy a full ticket. And he would just sit there uh, uh, against the window in his talus and keep on pray right along with them. And that's how they would do it. And I asked her a question about her father. I said, well, why didn't he, I said, you have relatives in England. You have relatives in the, so didn't he go back? And, and then it was when I learned my real lesson about what it meant to be in diaspora. She said to me, Number one, how is he going to get back? Number two, World War II happened in between coming to America and having children. And number three, back in those days, when you when you left and immigrated, you hugged somebody, you kissed them goodbye, and that was it. You know, there was no there was no smartphone, there was no computers, no email. Immigration meant committing your full body and soul to going to America, Canada, wherever you ended up. And that was a revelation for me because I didn't come from there, right? I came from exiled, enslaved people, carried away in chains. I understood they're sort of like, oh my God, I'll never go home again. But I didn't understand that other people have the same kind of dynamic, but in a very different way. That's great and a great observation. Thank you. Um, what What is black food? Is there black such food. a thing? Is it? Is it... African, is it the American South? Is it a hybrid? Tell us a little bit about how you define it. That's fantastic. Um, by the way, y'all, Avi said she come up with some good questions, and she did. We didn't we didn't plan this. Um, black food. Black food today in the United States is a it's it's what it's always been, really, but in different proportions. You know, we, we have the food that we have because of Africa, America, the Caribbean, Europe, Native America. Um, black food was created in, di- in many different spaces. Um, I don't have time to go over the whole history, but the bottom line is, think of, consider this. Like today, a lot of black people are eating jollof rice, which is West African. But jollof rice is very similar to red rice and jambalaya in black American cooking. I mean, very similar. It's tomatoes, onions, spices, and rice cooked together. Um, if you go to Brazil, the national dish is feijoada. Feijoada means it's like a bean-based thing. What are the beans? The beans are black black beans, and in some places, black eyed peas and rice. And you have collard greens, and you have barbecued meat. Who does it? And when it hot with hot sauce. Who does that sound like? You know, there are more people of African descent in Brazil than there are here. And when I did my DNA, I'm related to some of them. I'm related to black people all over the Americas. The Caribbean, very similar traditions in terms of fish and fowl and the spicing and the jerk chicken. Jerking is barbecuing. There's no, there's no difference. The jerk pork, the jerk chicken, is, the jerk fish is all the same thing as barbecuing in the American South. Um, but it's different, different wood, different style, but it's basically the same thing. All over the Americas, the black eyed peas, the pigeon peas, the rice and peas, the hot sauce, the hot peppers, there is a culinary grammar that we all subscribe to, you know? And it's fascinating to me because people try to isolate black Americans in, in this nexus of black people around the, around the planet. But the thing about it is though, in the Americas, we did a couple of amazing things. Number one, every single black population influenced the cooking, the food, the ideas about religion and sexuality and and political freedom and resistance. 
everywhere we went. Number two, we came up with a very similar cuisine, even though very few was went from, went from place to place. And number three, we came up with languages that were the bridge between the language of the slaveholder and the language of the enslaved. We enslaved the entire culture of the people who enslaved us, especially in the Caribbean, Brazil, and the United States, and Cuba, and Puerto Rico, and Haiti. In other words, there's no part of the culture that doesn't have us in it. No matter how bigoted people can be, it's all there. And um, lastly, we all use the same word to describe ourselves. Nation. Not shall, not shall. In other words, we saw ourselves as a people within a people, a, a, a different, a, a nation within another space. And our food is just the culinary equivalent of us saying we are a nation, we are a people, and we have something that we come from and something we want to pass on. So just a quick follow up to that, because we hear a lot these days about kind of culinary appropriation. Um, and I'm wondering when, when do you think, uh, uh, you know, it is, it is flattery for someone to take your style of cooking or your ingredients or your, your culinary vocabulary. And when is it disrespectful and, and appropriating? Great. Um, I think the word keyword here is respect and reciprocity. Um, I, 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 you know, I understand what, you know, particularly with American Jews, this is an interesting conversation because in American Jewish parlance, when non-Jewish people do Jewish except for when, you know, they do other things, I ain't gonna go there. Um, Cause we saw some examples of that recently this week that were horrifying. Um, we considered flattery. Oh, they're speaking a little bit of Yiddish, English. That's flat. That's flattering. Oh, they're honoring. They have a sign up in a store saying "Happy Hanukkah." That's flattering. I get it. That's that's cool. They, yeah, it does mean that America has been a very different place for Jews than, than other places where you don't see those. I've been to England. I've been to France. Um, been to Scandinavia. You you don't see that. It's not the same. But for Black people, every aspect. We you know, our bodies were exploited. Our wombs were exploited. Our, our brains were exploited. You know, if an enslaved person invented something, the slave owner by law got the credit. We, you know, rock and roll in the music industry, the, the history of crossover music is, is rob people of their money, their life, their fortune. What, you know, what does it mean to be told as a people? Why don't you all just work harder? Why don't you just, get, why don't you just be creative and be like us? And we did, we did this, why can't you? Well, we got our, 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 our ish stolen from us for 400 years. You know, people thought it was fair, it was nice. As long as we, as long as we kept on giving of ourselves, our time, our energy, our pro cultural productions, and didn't complain, there was a tax we paid for being allowed to live. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have, a, we have a problem when folks use their power, their platform, and their privilege to take an idea mass marketing, talk, take credit for it, and dance over our ancestors' graves. You know, um, I'll give you, the, 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 cause, so th here's, let me give you the good example first. Uh, my friend, Chef, my friend, Chef Chris Shepard in Houston had a restaurant where he, you know, was absorbing, Houston's an international city, Vietnamese, Nigerian, African-American, Mexican, German, all these impulses, right? And so what he would do is he had, a, in his restaurant, he had like a menu, but he would also say to people, hey, if you really like this dish, you should really go see my friend, Chef so-and-so over there in the Vietnamese community. And they will make the dish same day. You see how it, but I want you to support other, especially Houston ethnic communities, because that's mm -hmm. where I'm getting my inspiration. Bravo. Bad version. Nashville, Nashville hot chicken. Now everybody knows Nashville hot chicken because now it's been appropriated by fast food. But Nashville Hot Chicken started a restaurant called Prince's. But see, back in the day, when you went to Prince's, especially as a white person, you had you, the Prince's was it was all it was thoroughly surrogated in Nashville. So automatically, you're not going to have the best the the best zip code or the best whatever the best platform for your chicken. People went to the back door. Fast forward about forty years, young white chef comes in, power platform privilege, and a very Nashville is an up and coming Sun Belt town. People are moving there faster than Atlanta. 
He has a you know nice little cute restaurant in the in a posh side of town. People go crazy over his appropriation of Prince's recipe, and they think he invented it. That's the difference. Right. It's respect right. and reciprocity versus using your platform power and privilege to exploit a people right. i'm so sorry but you know when y'all were growing up and you watched you know we're watching reruns of uh i love lucy and he starts singing about babalu that's an african god and he's playing conga drums in the congo what no what no white cubans playing that music till they were taught by people brought from africa in chains and slave ships they were brought there until 1888 okay I don't want to make light of this, but when you when you start when you start in on Lucy, you know it could be trouble. It could be trouble. Yes, I understand. There's so many there, but there's so many words and ideas yeah. and feelings. I mean, I mean, last comment on that: there is not a white preacher in America on TV that doesn't preach black. I don't care if it's Joyce Myers. I don't care if it's Joe Austin with that mullet. All of them. They, they're, they're, they're fire and their fervor. That's not Christian. That's African. That's African American. That's Southern. That's, that's our, that's us. That's us being used to market these, these, these multi-million dollar churches. And I'm not saying you, I need a check for that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that I want people to understand that there's so many parts of our culture that come from this heritage and that they're so, you know, here's the last comment. Tiffany um, Haddish, who was black and Jewish, was recently asked to do a, a hosting for free. Can you imagine how long she's worked hard to get to, get to where she is? And all of a sudden, I'm asking her to do some work for free because they want her, her talent, her comedy. They want people to tune in. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a complex of ideas that says, your work is a multi-million idea, but I'm not going to pay you for it because you're black. Yeah. Michael. I'm going to do a lightning round with you. You there? Let's do it. Okay, really fast. Matzo brai, sweet or savory? Oh, shut savory. Onion with green onions. Really? Hands down. Cayenne yep. or horseradish? Cayenne or horseradish? Ouch, girl. <laughs> but okay, so if it's Passover, always horseradish. But any other time of year, it's cayenne. Um, Bereka or Pumantashen? Oh, Bereka, hands down, all the time. I was around Moroccans. I, uh, you got to have the uh, Bereka with lamb or with, with potato or with spinach, yes. Okay, so Pumantashen or Ruggala? Okay, I'm going to be basic chocolate Ruggala out the bag. The greens ones, y'all know what the ones I'm talking about. The little, the little, the little greens Pumantashen. It cost nine dollars a bag. Yeah, those. Sorry. All right, this is a, this is a little mean, but Joe Nathan or Julia Child? Oh, Joe Nathan, hands down. You know, mm -hmm. I owe part of my career to Joe Nathan, so I, you know, I got to represent. Okay. Also, also, I think um, Joe Nathan did something really had done something really special. I mean, she needs deserves a lot of honor. Her beautiful cookbook, were Jewish Cooking in America, and series. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really educated me as to the diversity of approaches. I mean, who else? I, I think she probably was the first person in a major cookbook to publish Coca-Cola brisket. So she deserves some honor for that. <laughs> Maybe. Um, cornmeal or matzo meal? Um, my matzo meal fried chicken comes out way better than my cornmeal fried chicken. So yeah, oh, right. matzo meal is the way to go. Okay, ancestry or history? Oh, snap, Ivy. All right, come on now, that wasn't fair. Um, ancestry. Really? Ancestry is a complex blend of things. Okay. And it's, it's something you have to navigate on your own. It's not, nobody can, and it's individual, right? Because even, I had to tell people, even in your family, yes, you may have the same like grab bag of genes, but every person, every sibling is a different mixture. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's spiritual as well as biological. And I think that it, it's a far better journey. I mean, history taught me almost nothing about myself. 
it was when I really started grappling with the different pieces. And I really, and, it, and it's, it's a multi-level. It's like one part of you is, ta- is trying to deal with the fact that you are this exile of, um, of West Africa. And then all which every trip I did there was revelatory. And the other part of me is that there is this tiny portion of me that is also Jewish. And I'm thinking about like, what are these people living in some shtetl or in some village in, 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 in medieval Italy, or especially in the British Isles or something, or some Native American town, they never think they would become me, right? <laughs> Surprise, guess who's coming to dinner? You know, that kind of thing. Um, but it also humanized me. It made me feel that, that you can be part of a, you know, a Venn diagram like we talked about, like you're, you are, when I cook, like when I found out I was like 1% Italian and I knew where it came from, I looked it up, I was like, how did I know that? How did I know that ultimately that road would lead me to Italy? And it did. And it was just like, I went, when I went to Italy, I was so like, I don't know, it was a weird feeling of like, yeah, I'm 1% Italian. And I told everybody that. And they, and these, 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 these grand, Italian grandmothers, they would like pinch me on the cheek and like hug me. And there was this weird feeling of just like, as I'm cooking with them and I'm just like, is this what it means to be human? Is this what it means to just be able to go anywhere and find family and mm. find a home? Mm. And, or do I have to be Italian? I guess I don't. But the fact that some small part of me, you know, I, I'm a history buff, came through Etruscans and Romans and Vesuvius and Garibaldi and some other nonsense to become me alongside these tribes from all over the world, but also to be fully engaged in being a black man in America. And to be able to do that without losing my mind is a gift. It's a beautiful answer, thank you. I wanna talk to you, uh, you know, I think we're getting close to closing in on, on last questions, but I want to ask you about our, our congregation cares a lot about food equity mm-hmm. um, and does a lot of work in that regard. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us about social justice and food and, and the intersection there and what it means to you. You know, we should probably like focus that in on what we're currently doing with the, in the aftermath in the midst of the pandemic. I mean, what's interesting is that to me is that I have all these friends, the black culinary world is not small, but it is close. You know, you don't, it doesn't take much to reach other people that are like you because we're very, we're very close knit. And what's interesting is that so many of us complained before the pandemic about like how few of us had the, the brick and mortar building. You know, what is that? What is it? What, what do I mean by that? You can't get no loan. There's redlining still. A lot of the southern community, deep southern communities, they keep that historical area pristine and for white tourists from the north and from Europe. Mm. Black people are, are marginalized in those spaces. But then the pandemic came and shut the white folks' restaurant down. So what did, what did the black chefs do? We did what we've been doing since segregation. We made plates for plates and sold them out our back doors. We had we had we always had the barbecue man on the corner. Y'all got that in Philadelphia from the Great Migration. I saw that growing up going to Philadelphia. You could go up to Philadelphia, go in this, you know, in black neighborhoods, and there'd be the barbecue man on 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 the street with the grill. Well, we had that in every southern community. So that's that started to happen. Then we started to make dinners on farms and on other people's property, putting picnic tables out, socially distancing making foods at a, at a uh, culinary incubator. You know, some of my friends, Omar, Chef Omar Tate and um, um, Kurt, Chef Kurt, have been, doing, and, um, have been doing these amazing, you know, dinners out, out of, um, out of uh, what is the area? I forget, her, I forget her name, but she's an amazing chef. She's a James Beard Award winner and nominee, uh, Mexican American Mexican American chef. But um, and it, it's part of Philadelphia. It's not far from the train station. Uh, so, uh, uh, Philly Barbacoa. Right, right, South Philly Barbacoa. And they've been using the kitchen. I mean, the, the fact that people have been cooperating across communities. So we have all these things that are showing us that despite some of the very deep parts 
racialized parts of the food industry. You know, who gets to write a Bon Appetit? Who gets to edit Bon Appetit? You know, who gets to, the, we have communities that are food deserts. What happens when the chefs who have, were informed about that journey, you know, Chef Kurt is amazing because he's working with folks who otherwise would have been tossed away by society for being felons, teach them how to cook because everybody has to eat and, they, and that everybody needs a job. So there's all these different levels of, of healing and, and black joy that are being resolved through food. My work is not so much in the kitchen as a chef, although I can cook my behind off. My work is more like, hey, you have a heritage, you have a story from the ground, from the water. These are the, these are the heirloom vegetables and, and heritage fruits we planted and grew. This is how we interacted with nature. We have our own sustainable nature culture from West Africa to the American South to the Great Migration. Here are the part, here's why your grandmother did what she did. Here's why granddaddy did what he did. Here's why you still do these things. You have a heritage, a story, and you have a responsibility to yourself, to your parents, to your ancestors, and to the generations to come. So all of us are doing this very much, this broad healing work. And it's, you don't have to be black to that work. You can be anyway. In, in the Jewish community, I'm, I'm, I'm so, um, um, I, met, I met some really good friends from the Jewish Farmers Network when I was in um, um, Lancaster for the, uh, the um, symposium. I, I spoke. And Shani, Shani, she was talking, we, were, we have this amazing conversation, Avi, about being Black, being Jewish, and farming. Because both communities have a lot of issues with the rural stuff. Because, you know, in, in Jewish culture, the idea was to get away from the shuttle, go to the city, and especially in, in, in North America, your Jewish culture is supposed to be urban. The farm is, is too retrograde. Same thing with black people. I don't want to go, I don't want grown up, I ain't no slave. Well, that's dumb because at the end of the day, um, like one of my buddies in LA, um, he, he's the, he calls himself the gangster gardener. He says, growing food is like growing money. You know, it's also keeping us out of the hospital for chronic illnesses that eating healthy food can cure. Mm -hmm. It's been a problem of our since slavery. It went from nutritional uh, issues to being issues of foods that it can exacerbate chronic conditions. So yeah, food is for, food is for us is very political. It's very cultural. It's very spiritual. It's historical. It's ancestral. It also provides a bridge to other communities and creates family among disparate folks. I hope that answered your question. It, it more than did that. And we are so grateful to you. Thank you also to Kara Schneider. Christina Martinez is the name that we couldn't think of. Yes, Christina, yes. So thanks to our congregants. We, we would love to have you back when Kosher Soul is out. We'd love to have Shabbat with you at RS. And um, I want everyone to, can we put the thing in the chat again about getting, getting Michael's book on, um, I hope from Harriet's or an independent bookstore. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. It is like you are, it is brilliant, engaging, oh. insightful, full of incredible stories not to mention the recipe for black eyed pea hummus and West African brisket. So yeah, I, I actually had somebody Ivy who told me that was like their their mother is really hard on them, but that that was the best brisket ever. I was like, ah, that's the greatest compliment. Wow. No, well, it's it's really it's a lot more than recipes. The, Thank this you. Is, really interesting history and great stories and brings us all together in a very powerful way, which you did this evening. Thank you so much. It was a delight. No, thank you. And I'm, I'm, I went down in James Beard history, the Oscars of the food world as being the first person to say this Chehekianu from <laughs> that stand. And I gotta tell you one quick story. If I have a minute, have a minute, very quick yeah. story. So when the cookie gene was being sold, one particular publisher, I should not name names. I would, my mom had just passed away and I'm on the road in North Carolina, literally on, in, the, in rural North Carolina, pulled us whole inside the road, had this conference with my agent and with the folks. And one of the lead editors, the kind of gatekeeper person, just scoffed at the notion of me talking about being Jewish. 
And it was really confusing to me because I thought, you know, I all these conferences I'd been to, all these meetings, everybody was said they wanted somebody unique and different and with a different story to tell. And I'm like, hey, I'm here, I'm gay, I'm black, I'm Jewish, I'm from the South, come on now, can't get more unique than this, okay? So um, these these folks were just so ambivalent, and not amb they weren't ambivalent, they were, they were antagonistic towards me being openly Jewish as an author for them. And they, they asked my Asian, could I not wear a keep on public and all this other nonsense. So I had to have a real um, um, Koufax moment. You know, I was like, nah, we ain't doing this. And one of them, the, the lead editor lady, she was like, she has this nervous laughter on the phone. She says, I don't think America's ready for ready for you. And that's when I got the real fire in me. And I was like, uh-uh, I'm gonna do this. So after, after, after the award ceremony, I was really nervous. I hadn't eaten for like a day, I was that nervous. And the same people who were there that said, nah, we can't have no black Jewish all of this book. We got, you gotta hide that Judaism. I saw the one that stayed before me and I said, if, if I don't win, I'm gonna scream right out of here because but if I win, I'm gonna say something. I wore kippa, I wore tzitzit, I wore dashiki and a kente cloth, and I ran my little rainbow triangle from back in back in my teenage gay days. I wore every little thing I had to say. And when I got up on that stage, my first words after the Shehayanu was the poem by Langston Hughes that says, um, "One day, you'll know how beautiful I am, and let me sit at the table." So I want everybody to understand, no matter what uh, dream or hope you have, uh, people, people, you know, God will send you um, uh, Bilam. Remember Bilam was the prophet sent to curse the tents of Israel. And when he opened his mouth, the, the donkey started talking before him. And when he opened his mouth, he could only bless Israel. So even though the people in that room, who, by the way, were also Jewish, didn't think they weren't confident in my identity and my ability to, to sell this book and the story part of the story of my life god had another plan and i want everybody to understand i'm proud to be a jew this past year i'm proud to be people that said saving lives is more important than being symbolic of other things i'm proud to be a people that said when we needed a new year the most when things were getting bad again we had a new year and opportunity to renew ourselves and I'm proud to be people that in the midst of darkness had a holiday that celebrated light and God's love. And um, I'm proud I've kept my kippa on. Not only because it covers the gray hairs my kids gave me from Hebrew school, but because I taught a lot of kids that um, it is their job not to let go of the Torah. No matter how religious they are, how many they were the latter, it's not their job. Their job is to keep this going, you know, Lador Vador for generation to generation. And if I can do it, they can do it. We have got, a, we've got a, we're a crazy people, but we have so many things we have to bring to the world and teach the world. And I'm so proud to be family with you all in that tradition and our, and our peoplehood. So thank you all very much. This has been amazing for me. And thank you, Serena and 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 Dina and other folks for 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 hanging on to me, you know, all this this long, this long journey to this night. I really appreciate everybody. And I'm I'm very grateful. Um again that we're family through Avraham and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much. Well, we are incredibly grateful for this time and I'm um, so moved by you sharing your heart with us and by this whole evening and, and very honored to spend this time with you. And thank you so much, Ivy, for your, um, your questions. It was really insightful and an engaging, really wonderful evening. Uh, before, before we all take off, I just want to switch gears for a moment and share that this is the first event in our four philanthropic programs for the year. Just want to make sure you all are aware of what we have coming up next. So our Cook and Connect part two is called Sababa Cooking with Adina Sussman, which will be Sunday, February 21st from 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. for brunch. And it'll be 
moderated by congregant and past president Fred Strober. During the program, we will join the world-renowned chef, the New York Times bestseller, as we take a journey into Israeli and Arab cooking traditions, and we'll learn how to make a delicious tahini smoothie while discussing how food is a creative tool that can speak to our identity and bridge cultural differences. Then our Cook and Connect Part 3 series will be a fireside chat and cooking demo with Julia Tertian on Sunday, March 7th from 6.30 to 8 p.m., moderated by our fellow beloved congregant, Ellen Poster. During the program, we will join this award-winning chef for a cooking demo. She takes us through her favorite childhood recipes and her quest for equity at the table. Tertian is a best-selling author of the critically acclaimed cookbook, Now and Again, as well as Feed the Resistance and Small Victories. She hosts the podcast, Keep Calm and Cook On, and she is the founder of Equity at the Table, which is an inclusive digital directory of women and non-binary individuals in food. Um, then we will welcome back Michael Solomonoff to Road of Shalom to hear his story of addiction and recovery on Sunday, May 2nd from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And for the second half of the program, there will be a panel discussion moderated um, by our fellow congregant, Colleen Berry, who is the chair um, of the Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And the panel will also feature Richard Roisman, who is a Karen Board of Trustees member at Karen Treatment Centers, and Dr. Tom Scott, who is a pain management specialist. Um, please be sure to sign up on our website, and there's also a link in the chat box to sign up. Um, and again, Michael, this has been an honor and a privilege and a joy to spend this time with you. And I know we are all incredibly grateful. And thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you.